So today's speaker is Stefan de Bievre. Um, Stefan got a Bachelor of Science at the University of Leuven in Belgium. And then he went to the Ro Rochester University in New York, where he did a PhD in physics. After that, he's done a, a postdoc at uh, the maths department of the University of Toronto, after which he became a professor of maths, first in Paris and then in Lille, where he's currently conducting research. And his current research uh, areas of interest are like mathematical aspects of physics, so quantum chaos, statistical mechanics, and then recently quantum optics. And today he's going to tell us about some of his work on quantum optics and quantum non-classicality. Um, so very much looking forward to that. Uh, thank you very much, Stefan, for, for joining us. Um, let's see if we can get the screen sharing to, to work as nicely as we could in the, in the trial session. Okay, so here we go. Um, you should see my screen now, I think. Yes, this, this looks perfect. Great. So, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here, so to speak. Uh, I would have been happier even to be there, but um, it's a great opportunity to uh, talk about some of my recent work. Uh, uh, and um, so, um, uh, thank you very much for that and for the introduction. So what I will talk about today is, is written right there. Uh, my, my, my pitch is for the quadrature coherence scale, which is a notion we introduced and that I will explain, of course, and that we claim to be a nice tool to analyze non-classicality in uh, quantum optics, and uh, which is related also to environmental decoherence and uh, actually entanglement. Uh, and so I hope to explain all that in about half an hour. And um, uh, well, feel free to ask questions even during the talk, in as far as this is possible. Um, so, um, so here we go. Ah, wait, and now this thing doesn't turn. Ah, here it goes. Uh, yes. So I, I hope you see the second slide now. Um, so the, I, I will start off softly and sort of give the general background question that 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 uh, that, that is in my mind, uh, and, and it's a very general question. It's what distinguishes quantum from classical mechanics. And um, so, so uh, to elaborate a little bit, this is the kind of question I would have discussed with you people if I was in Cambridge and we would have gone to a pub some evening, then I would have asked this question in the pub. And I would have asked you people, um, what are the features of quantum mechanics that uh, clearly distinguish it from uh, classical mechanics? Uh, another way to put it uh, is how, uh, in which ways is quantum mechanics non-classical and, and maybe even why do we find quantum mechanics surprising? And so uh, these are of course questions that have uh, been asked many times. And I think the, if I asked you for some keywords, you would give me more or less the following list of keywords if I asked you to, to, to tell me. And so the, the one thing is, of course, the uncertainty principle and, and its link with incompatible observables. This is something we think of as being a typical quantum uh, effect. Uh, very much related to this is interference from phenomena. You know, the wave particle duality, the two slit experiment, with, uh, experiment uh, which is again linked to incompatible observables. Another one, uh, some people will say, okay, well, this is all nice, but underlying both of these phenomena is just a superposition principle. It's just the fact that in quantum mechanics, you can make uh, coherent superpositions, linear combinations of states. And this is at the origin of both these uh, phenomena. And then uh, if there is a quantum optics person in the audience, he will say, well, in quantum optics, uh, these things, the non-classicality manifests itself in the existence of optically non-classical states. And, and this is really what I will talk about more uh, later on. So it's, it's in, in the context of quantum optics. Uh, this is where you get to see non-classical effects. Of course, uh, everybody will say at some point, well, when the real, this stuff, what you just said, the superposition principle and all that, it's the easy part. The real difficult and the real interesting stuff is in the entanglement. Entanglement is what distinguishes quantum from classical mechanics. And, and, the, and, and related to that, non-locality, the EPR paradox, all of that. And, and I think maybe somebody I certainly would add to that, uh, the Pauli exclusion principle, which is, and of course, all these things are related to Pauli exclusion principle. I like to mention it because without it, uh, we wouldn't be here. Uh, the, 
matter wouldn't exist. Uh, it, matter wouldn't be stable. So, so uh, this is a long list of phenomena people associate with typical quantum uh, behavior. Now, before even starting to answer, we, we could ask, well, well, why do we care? Now, why do we care about these differences? Uh, why is this interesting? And, and there is a physicist answer to this, I think, which is, uh, well, it's a fundamental scientific interrogation. We'd, we'd like to understand why the microscopic world that we are used to is different from, from the microscopic one. There's also an engineering answer, or maybe a politician's answer, or the answer of the funding agency, which says, well, if you really understand these things, you may be able to build a better quantum mousetrap. And, and so, so, so this is uh, another view. Now, these two views are nicely, uh, they, they're, not, they're not necessarily conf uh, conflicting. You, 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 and, and, and I like the way um, Henri Poincaré said it a long time ago, about a century ago. Um, he, he writes, I do not say science is useful because it helps us build machines. I say machines are useful because they free time for us to do more science. So if you think about it this way, then these two aspects of the, the, the interest in the question uh, sort of harmoniously uh, come together. So, so the question is, where is the boundary between classical and quantum mechanics and how do we identify it and, and, and what can we say about it? And so in the case, and so now, now to, to move into the, the core of the, the talk, um, I want to talk about the case of the quantized electromagnetic field, uh, uh, which, uh, in which the question takes sort of three, um, three forms. There is this notion of coherence indeed, there is optical non-classicality and there is entanglement. And the question is how you can actually quantify these three distinct manifestations of non-classical behavior. I, I like to insist that non-classical behavior can take on many forms, depends on what system you look at, and how you look at it. And, and in each case, you, you, you may want to quantify. It. And so the question is, how, for example, how non-classical is a given quantum state? So you're given a state of a system, in this case, I'll think of an electromagnetic field, and you want to say, well, is this state very much non-quantum, uh, non-classical, or is it not so very different from a classical state? And the answer to that question is, is, is well, I think everybody agrees, uh, it's known. Uh, you, you need to know, use uh, what people call either weaknesses or measures, or if possibly monotones, which come from resource theories. So you need some quantitative measure of the degree to which the state is entangled, the degree to which it is non-classical. Okay, so, so and, and the, the people come up with various measures and witnesses, and, and sometimes people get very excited and, and very upset at each other because they say mine is better than yours, but, but usually this means that it has a different use, that it can be, so, some measures can be useful in some contexts and others in other contexts. So, so I like to be mm, sort of uh, rather open about this because it, in these discussions, people sometimes get quite uh, bent out of shape and there's no need for that, I think. So, the, the, once you have decided which witnesses or measures you want to use, there is a second question, which is how to relate these things. For example, a state can be very optically non-classical perhaps and, and, and not entangled, but can a state be very entangled and, and not very optically non-classical? And, and how are these different things related? They're all sort of manifestations of something we're not used to in classical mechanics, but they're different manifestations and, and you'd like to compare them. At least I would like to compare them. I think it's interesting to compare them. And so to do that, once you have decided what witnesses, measures and, reefs and, and monotones you will use, uh, well, you need to establish bounds between these things, okay? So again, as I said already, the answers I, in my view, depend on the context, on the system considered and on the phenomenon analyzed. And so I, I hope to provide some answers. And, and my pitch today is that this quantum coherence scale, which I will introduce in a second, is a tool to do this. It, it, it has some very nice aspects and it, it does all of that. It, it, it does all of that. Okay, so that's the end of my introduction. How long did that take? About eight minutes, that's okay, I think. And so again, my, my, my central uh, tool will be this coherence scale. 
and be, before moving to the quadrature coherent scale, which is the thing, uh, the coherent scale used in quantum optics, let me introduce this coherent scale. And, and so to introduce it is, is very simple. Uh, I just remind you of, of um, how interference works in quantum mechanics, okay? And, and, and so you have just some system, any system you want, you have two non-commuting observables, A and B, and I take them to be um, non-degenerate with a point spectrum uh, to make things easy. And, and what I wrote, and, and I don't, ah, yes, do you see my pointer? Yeah, we, we see, we you see, see this thing. There. Okay, so yeah, then yeah. I can point. Good. Okay, good. So, so, um, so you take two non-commuting observables and you have a state rho, there it is. And the pro this thing here, PAI, is of course the probability that if the state uh, is rho, you measure uh, the value AI when measuring A. And, and the same thing for this one here, PB uh, of BM. And now if you write this one out, let me move this here. It, uh, it has two terms. Well, like I split it in two terms. I split it in a diagonal part uh, by sticking in uh, two, two resolutions of the identity and an, and an off-diagonal part. And the uh, diagonal part we usually call the classical term. So you see the word classical shows up here. We call it the classical term because it's the term you would expect if you applied ordinary um, classical probability theory. You know, it's the probability that you find the value AI when measuring I, A, uh, multiplied by the conditional probability that you find BM having uh, measured AI. You sum this up and this gives you what you expect classically. And the rest of it is, is the unexpected part. It, it's, uh, and, and, and it is depending on the off-diagonal matrix elements, which people call the coherences, which are the AI rho AJ. And it depends also, of course, the, on the matrix elements uh, AI BM. So, so this is uh, the general setup of any kind of interference experiment. What you do is uh, you, 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 you compute this or you measure this and you move VM around and you see a pattern. And this pattern is not explained by the first term. You need the second term. And then if you do that, if you have that kind of phenomenon, you say, aha, this is a typical quantum phenomenon because what I expect from classical reasoning is only the first term and the second term is apparently needed because nature does something else. So in particular, if this matrix rho, this density matrix rho is diagonal in the A basis, then, then you don't see the quantum behavior of this state at all. That doesn't mean this state is not somehow a quantum state. Maybe you just picked your observables badly. You should have used maybe a, yeah, but certainly you shouldn't have used A. And maybe you, you, by using uh, other observables, you can see the quantum nature, nature but, but not in this particular way. Now, to the, this coherence, the, the strength of the second term is in particular, but not only, uh, defined by these coherences. And so people have come up with various measures of these coherences. And one typical example is the one I wrote down here on the bottom. Uh, it's a matrix norm. You, you, you sum up all these non-diagonal matrix elements squared uh, and you call that, I call it C2 of rho. And it's somehow a measure of the coherence. But of course, uh, this thing could be large and this coherence and this term could be small anyway because these things fluctuate, right? So it's, it's not so clear that this term by itself guarantees that um, there is a large uh, interference term, but at least it's some measure of the of the possibility for the states to uh, manifest interference. Okay, so that's the basics of interference and coherence, at least the way I see it. Let's see, let me see whether it works. Okay. Um, so we came up with, so now I'm moving a little bit uh, closer to, to what we've been doing, is, is some other measure that is associated to these coherences. And it is very simple. It's written in the middle here in this orange box. Uh, you just stare at it for a second. I, I still sum over all the matrix elements a i rho a j squared, but I multiply it with a i minus a j squared, and I don't have to eliminate the diagonal elements because they're gone anyway. Because if a i equals a j, then they're not no longer there. So uh, this object here is what I call the a coherence scale. Okay, and uh, I have divided it by p here, this thing here, which is the purity. 
And this comes from the fact that uh, I think of this, it's written a little bit lower here, the AI rho AJ squared divided by P, they form a probability distribution, a discrete probability distribution because they add up to one. And so, so, so this coherence scale is a weighted average with respect to this probability distribution, okay? And so in a way it measures not how many coherences there are or how big they are, but how far they are from the diagonal, because it's clear that if AI minus AJ is small, then this term is small. And so it, 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 it attaches more weight to terms with, that are farther away from the diagonal. So it's just a weighted average of the coherences of the matrix row in the A basis. And the weighting is done in such a way that more weight is put on off diagonal matrix elements. That's the thing, okay? And it is all written down on this slide in various places. Now, what's nice about this is that it can be rewritten in this, in this way on the right here. It's just a trace of row commutator, A, a commutator row, which uh, has the advantage that this expression makes sense even if A is not uh, discrete. So you, you, you have a nice closed expression and maybe we can discuss it a bit more what this means, but, but this is a nice clean expression in terms of the matrices, the, the state and up and the observable without using a basis, okay? But so this is the A coherence scale. P is the purity, I said that, it's a way that average, okay. And now in my next slide, here it is. Uh, or a little example for, well, this next slide, I would normally not have uh, shown if I was really there because then I, I would have just uh, talked to you people on the blackboard and asked some questions. This slide really has a question in it that I don't have the answer to at all, but I just want to throw it at you and take a few minutes. Uh, maybe somebody has an idea. So, so, so I just defined the coherence scale, okay? So, so we know what it is. And here's a simple example. So if you take, uh, I, I took, a a harmonic oscillator or, or one mode of an electromagnetic field. This is the ground state or the vacuum. And this is the nth excited state. And I take this uh, coherent superposition. Well, it's very easy. If you compute the coherence scale of this thing, I should have put a square on there, I think. Uh, the coherence scale of this thing with respect to n, n being the number operator, you find n squared over two. It's not too surprising because the, the coherence is here. There is just two of diagonal matrix elements. And if n is large, they're far from the diagonal. And if n is small, they're close. And, and so this, this thing measures that. If you look at what I called C2, which is just the sum of the coherences themselves, that does not depend on n. It's obvious because it just adds one quarter plus one quarter or something like that. So you get that. Okay, uh, so, so this is just to show you the difference between the, the measuring just how many coherences there are, how much coherence there is, and measuring where they are, and where meaning how far from the diagonal. And then of course, if you take this state, which is a, mix, a mixture, then there is no coherences there because it's diagonal. And, and there is also the coherence scale is also vanishing, of course. Now in general, for pure states, if you go back at the expression, you will say that if, see that in fact this coherent scale is equal to the, the, the variance or the uncertainty, if you wish, in the in the observable A. And now, now here comes so so this is some background to get a feeling for what this thing is. And now, for those who are familiar with the quantum fissure information, there is at least a superficial uh, um, how to say similarity between the quantum Fisher information for which I wrote F A rho here, Fisher A, which is in, to remember that it is uh, uh, the quantum Fisher information of the state rho with respect to the observable A. And, and you know, if you look at these two expressions, well, I should be a little slower here. So I say there is a link, why? Because if you compute this um, in coherence scale, you can rewrite it in, in, in instead of write, you can rewrite it uh, like this. So if, you, if your row is diagonal like this, in some basis, not in the A basis, but in some other basis, th then the quantum coherence scale can be written like this. And it is well known that the quantum Fisher information is written like this, and it just looks a little similar, right? It, 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 so, so there is a link. And the link isn't very clear to me. I have some ideas on it, and it'd be interesting to have a clearer view of what the link is. And so that's sort of, uh, uh, an open question. And there's a, a second question here. Um, 
I, I'm going to promote this quantum coherence scale as a tool uh, for studying non-classicality. And I, I, I claim that I will be able to convince you that for uh, uh, in quantum optics, it really is a useful tool. It's an interesting thing. But I've presented to you uh, it to you in, in a very general co context. You can use this in systems with the finite dimensional phase space, and, and you can define this thing. Um, although in that case, well, you, at least with discrete spectra. Um, and, and the question then should be, well, what's it going to be good for in that situation? And of course, you could hope it has something to do with large interference, strong interference. And I don't know if that is generally true. So the question would be, suppose you have some state of a system and an observable A and the state has a large coherence scale. Can you find some operator B, some observable B, so that there is a uh, strong interference? And, and I don't know. But this is sort of a question I would have asked to you people you know, in your offices or on the blackboard in the tea room if I had been there. And so I'm asking you now. So now I go back to my talk. So I gave an introduction. I said to you what the coherence scale is. You can have a, it's a very simple object. And now we're moving on to quantum optics. And so in the case of quantum optics, I will call this thing the quadrature coherence scale. And so here is the definition. It's now we can go quite quickly because it's, it's most, it has been mostly uh, prepared. So in quantum optics, you have a, a field with two quadratures, but if you're not used to quantum optics, you can think of one mechanical oscillator with position and momentum and one creation and annihilation operator uh, and one annihilation operator with the usual commutation rule. Uh, and what I define to be the quadrature coherence scale is just a sum of the uh, coherence scales of the of the two quadratures, meaning of the position and the momentum. So this thing I introduced before, and this thing too, and I just make the sum. And in this case, these don't have discrete spectra, but so the expression uh, in terms of um, of the matrix elements of the density matrix are the same. You here you get an integral instead of a sum. And these are the uh, matrix elements of the density matrix in the X basis and, and they're in the P basis. And so it's the same expression, the same kind of thing. And we still don't know what this is good for because I haven't told you, uh, but, but the object is quite clear, okay? So uh, what you can immediately see that a large uh, quadrature coherence scale means that at least one of these two terms is large. That means the off-diagonal matrix elements either in the X basis or the P basis must be basis must be large. And a small uh, uh, quadrature coherence scale means that both of them are leaf close. In both cases, there are very few matrix elements, off-diagonal matrix elements far from the diagonal. Okay, so that's the definition. Now, uh, some examples, so we get a feeling for this. So here are some examples of pure states. Uh, we can start on the left, a cat state. Well, this is what people call uh, this object here. A cat state is just a superposition of a coherent state uh, centered at some point alpha and another one centered at minus alpha. Here we took alpha to be four. You can take alpha to be real. So it's a Gaussian centered at four and another Gaussian centered at minus four, minus four in the X spaces, for example. So there's two Gaussians. And if you look at the, the matrix elements of, um, they're written up here, right? O of the density matrix in the X basis, you get this picture here. Where red, of course, means uh, high values uh, uh, and green low values. And you see there is these uh, four blobs, two of which are off diagonal. If you look at the scale, how far are they from the diagonal? Well, it's written there, it's roughly four. And this sort of makes sense, okay? So, so indeed, uh, this, this uh, quadrature coherence scale, when computed for a cat state, produces a number that tells you how far from the diagonal this, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the off-diagonal matrix elements live. You can do the same for a Fox state, and it looks a little messier because there's some stuff all over the place, but it's the same idea. Th this is not diagonal. There is stuff off the diagonal, and the scale on which the off-diagonal uh, part lives is given uh, by, this, uh, by, by, by this one number, which is uh, the quadrature coherence scale. Okay, there are some more examples. Here, these are uh, mixed states. Mixed states can also have a large quadrature coherence. And uh, first, I give one which doesn't. Uh, the thermal state with a mean photon number equal five. So 
it corresponds to some mean energy or five times h bar omega, if you wish. Um, you see, this is completely uh, lined up with the diagonal. A thermal state of sufficiently high temperature um, doesn't have off diagonal matrix elements. And you can see that in the formula here, it actually decreases like n with n bar with the temperature. Uh, and in this state here, uh, and, uh, well, it's a non-Gaussian state. This is written up there because this state is Gaussian. It doesn't really matter, but let's look where it is. Here it is, this state rho m. The two, the, these states here are, uh, folk, uh, are, are number states, eigenstates of the number operator. So they are uh, 2k photon states. And it's just a mixture, a very simple mixture, but it's only a mixture of uh, even states from one to m. In the picture, M is four, I think. Yes, that's written up there. And so the quadrature coherence is about 3.6. And again, you can see this just one glance at the picture. You look at the scale of, yeah, look, okay, there is a, an off diagonal branch which stretches about three to four units away from the diagonal. So, so, so it is correct, at least, to say that this quadrature coherence scale captures the location of the coherences. Good. But we still don't know what it's good for. I have just told you that what it is and, and that, that it seems to do what you expect it to do. So in, I also said that in general, I don't know if you can always uh, exhibit strong interference if you have a high quadrature coherent state uh, scale. I don't know that, but here is an example where you can do that, where you can see this. And I, I think I will take, well, Time goes, I guess I have at least 10 more minutes. So, so there we go. So let me take the time to explain this. So, so we're still in this quadrature coherent scale business. And in this case, uh, yes, yes. We take the same state and the picture that I showed before is there. And the picture on the right, he just shows PNN. What is PNN? It's the probability that uh, you find the value N if you measure the number operator uh, with the state rho M. And of course, this is zero on the odd cases, on the odd numbers, and, and equal to one fourth uh, up there in a two, four, six, and eight, because m equals four. And so the line is just there to make you see that this is sort of like an interference pattern. Negative, uh, destructive interference, et cetera, uh, constructive interference. Now, split this thing into a diagonal part and an off diagonal part with respect to the X operator. So I can write uh, this quantity as an integral over the uh, over rho X, X prime, and then the matrix elements uh, X, N, and N, X prime. These are of course uh, Hermit polynomials, right? And I can integrate this thing close to the diagonal and away from the diagonal. L is a little parameter that tells me how close to the diagonal I am and how far I am. I cannot integrate only along the diagonal because this, is a, this has continuous spectrum, but I can take a small script and cut out the diagonal part. And if I do that, you can see you get these two lines. For example, if you cut off at, uh, uh, at one, this, this little one there, so you take only the diagonal part of the uh, density matrix in the X representation, then the, the, the values for the diagonal part are here. So they're very far from the correct values. And if you cut uh, a little more, if a little farther away, you capture a bit more, then you get closer to the correct uh, values. So in other words, you can see that indeed, what is happening here, if I cut this off, I'm, I'm, if I cut it, th that means I take an integral here over this region, then I've not used these two branches. And if I don't use these two branches, I don't get the interference effect. So the interference effect is really due to the parts that live far away. And if I cut it off, it's no longer there. Okay. So this is an example where you can see large coherent, large coherent scale is indeed responsible for interference. But this is just an example. Uh, so now we get into uh, the serious stuff. I have defined an object and I'm going to tell you it's good for something. Here it is. So in, in quantum optics, there is a notion of a classical state. This is an old notion. It's written in the middle here. Uh, it, it goes back to 1963. And at the time people decided, Titular and Grauber and Sudarshan decided that in the context of quantum optics, a good definition of a classical state is a state that's a mixture of coherent states. Again, if you're not used to quantum optics, it doesn't matter. You think of one oscillator, 
we have all learned that one coherent state is a pure state that is the closest you can get to classical because it has a very it has the smallest possible uncertainty and so what they said is uh, well if you take a mixture of such things you still have a classical state and look at this here this is a mixture and it's important that p is positive so it's it's an it's, it's a nice mixture of um of, of, of coherent states and, and this makes what is called an optically classical state okay and once this definition came about people started to wonder well given a state how do i decide if it is uh, classical or not given for example thermal states are very easy to see seem to be classical there is photon subtracted states which are defined like this uh, they're also classical uh, number states and schrodinger cat states are not to their quantum then there is photon other thermal states which are uh, which are not classical or not optically classical and, and there is a whole zoo of things where you can but it's not so easy if i give you a state to decide whether it is or not of this form it's not easy to decide and so people said well we need a, a variety of we need some tools and so uh, i don't i will not go to the literature but basically if you look at the literature between 1965 and 1985 you find 50 or 100 papers proposing various things. And then there is a silent period of about 15 years. And then under the impulse of quantum information theory, uh, with continuous variables, there is a revival of this question. And so uh, two years ago, you can see the date up there, 2019, uh, we contributed uh, to this issue by saying, basically in one line, that uh, the quadrature coherence scale that I uh, introduced is a nice measure of non-classicality, of optical non-classicality. So uh, the, the thing, the theorem is written in, a, uh, in, 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 in the orange box here. What we showed is that if zero, the, the, non, the, the quadrature coherence scale of the state is strictly bigger than one, then indeed the state is non-classical. So it is, and we did a bit better than that. We uh, showed that uh, um, if, if, if this quadrature coherence scale is very large, then you're very far from the, the classical states. And if it is very small, you're very close. And some other results along those lines. But what you should recall from this is that this quadrature coherence scale, which is a very simple object, uh, in principle, not so hard to compute, could even in principle be measured. The, it, it is a witness of non-classicality. And it can be turned into a measure of non classical a, a witness is this that is, that is this thing here. If it is bigger than one, you can sh be sure your state is non classical. If it is smaller than one, you're not quite sure, but we can turn it into a measure. And, and so I won't explain that. But so it's a tool to make a measure of non classical. Okay. Um, I will not mention that. I will just go on. So I give one figure of merit, as people like to say, of this quadrature coherence scale is that it is a, a useful me uh, means to detect whether states are non-classical or not. So I would like to say, okay, so I would like to say a word about uh, uh, the link between the quadrature coherence scale and decoherence. Why? Well, it is, it's written there, right? We, we have a tendency to think that if a state, if, if some state manifests very strong non-classical properties of any, of any kind, then it is very fragile, meaning that if you couple the state to an environment, it will very quickly lose these properties. This is the decoherence business, right? So I repeat, we tend to think that if a state, that if some feature, if a state has some very non-classical features, then it is hard to protect those because any kind of environmental um, interference will destroy them. So if I'm going to claim that a large quantum coherence scale is a feature of non-classicality, then you may suspect that it should be very fragile. And we proved that, OK? And it, it's written, I won't write down any equations or any uh, of the precise model. But we, we did what people usually do. We coupled. Um, we coupled the, the oscillator or the, the mode of the, of the field to a thermal bath with a, a master equation in the Lindblad in the Lindblad form. Okay, this you can write that down. There is a standard way to do this, and we computed the time evolution. It's written here: the time evolution of this quadrature coherence scale. 
And we showed that indeed, if initially you have a state rho zero, right? T goes zero. If you initially you have a very large quadratic coherence scale, you have very large off diagonal elements in your density matrix, then it will decohere very quickly. And actually the decoherence time will be proportional to the inverse squared of the, of the quadrature coherence. So I like to put it this way, uh, the more you have of it, the quicker you lose it, okay? It goes very fast. And you also lose purity very fast. And I illustrated it here with the same state. And um, so this is again, the same state we have before, a mixture of even uh, number states, four of them with the coherences drawn here. This is the picture I showed you before. And this is a picture on the right there where you see the time evolution. So at t equals zero, you have uh, indeed the initial state, uh, the probabilities p and n are graphed there. So there, there are uh, uh, one quarter at the even ones and zero at the odd one. And then you let time evolve and you see the interference disappears. At, at time zero, zero 0.3, for example, you have this blue line and you can still see some interference in the sense that you still have this uh, wiggly line, but it is it very much attenuated. And it is attenuated in the same way as on the left-hand side. Why is it attenuated? Because the off-diagonal matrix elements have disappeared. Okay, so, so this shows you that this tool to measure non-classicality, uh, does something we expect. Uh, as time evolves, it, uh, the, the, non, the, the quadrature coherence scale decreases very fast, okay? Okay, so then I can just uh, very quickly say a word about the last part. See, if you remember the, my introduction, I sort of made a list of non-classical features and I split it in two. There's everything related to coherent superpositions, uh, uncertainty principle, incompatible observables, and then there is entanglement. Of course, entanglement is still linked to coherent superpositions, but, but for entangled, you can't be entangled all along. You need at least two parts to your system, right? So it's, 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 it's a different ball game. Now, we have some results on entanglement that I will uh, try to very quickly sketch. How do, why doesn't this turn out? Ah, okay. Um, What's happening here? Okay. Um, uh, okay, so th this slide uh, basically does it. So I, I will say the following. Uh, we have linked optical non classically to uh, classicality to decoherence through the quadrature coherence scale, but we want to link it to entanglement. And the intuitive thing is this. Somehow, if a state is strongly entangled, it, would sh it should be strongly optically non-classical because all these optical non-classical states are not entangled. So somehow, if you're very entangled, you should be uh, very strongly optically non-classical. The contrary should not be uh, true. So you would like to find upper bounds for, the for various entanglement measures by the optical non-classicality. And this is what we did. And I'll just uh, give you... Uh, well, there, one example. So we consider it um, an n-mode field this time. You need more than one mode, uh, split it in two. Uh, and we showed, um, we looked at the entropy of formation, which is a, a standard thing to look at. Here, I just wrote it down for pure states. You look at the entry of for, entropy of formation, and we showed that it is bounded by the logarithm of the uh, quadrature coherence scale. So this means uh, that, um, the, opt uh, the optical non-classicality of a state grows exponentially with the entanglement uh, of the state. Okay, so it, it, is, it is expected, of course, I repeat, I already said it, right? if the state is entangled, it should be non-classical, optically non-classical. But the question is how much, how much so? And so the, this bound gives you, it tells you it should be exponentially large, okay? Okay, so, so uh, I will not uh, detail the rest here uh, uh, any further and I'll just, I think I can just wrap up in the conclusion. Um, yes, uh, so the question, my, 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 my takeaway message is the following. If you are interested in non-classical features of states of Bose fields, then I am advocating the quadrature coherence scale as a tool that you could, you could use, right? And I've explained that if it is large, then you have at least two things happening. 
The state is going to be strongly optically non-classical and it will be very sensitive to environmental decoherence. And in some sense, this quantity controls entanglement. If it is small, entanglement is certainly small. And if entanglement is large, it is exponentially large. And so I gave some references here, uh, additional references to the ones I already gave before. And um, I think with that, I can thank you. And if you have any courage left, you can ask me questions. OK, thanks a lot, Stefan. This was a super nice talk. It's, it's nice with talks from uh, mathematicians that you can actually understand. Uh, um, I, I should say to everyone who's who's joining, I can see we have 26 people on the call at the moment. If if any one of you want, want to ask Stefan a question um, about this work, please just put your name and uh, or the question in the Q&A button and we will promote you to a panelist and you can come on to the panel and uh, and ask a question. Um, see that Hugo, you've raised your hand. But we cannot hear you. Sorry, yeah, I was muted. I have a, a quick question. Th this was a really nice talk, by the way. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I was really interested by the 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 last part. So that uh, large uh, QCS implies a really fast decoherence. And I was yes. wondering if you could comment on the limit that this would put on the size of a possible quantum computer. And so Ooh. in a quantum computer, we want to entangle as many qubits as possible and have a really, really large interconnected and uh, that everything be everything stay quantum. Does this put a fundamental limit on how big a quantum computer could get? I have to think about that one. Uh, it's a nice question. Um, I wouldn't give, I mean, when you talk, well, I think about it, it it's a, uh, that's a nice question. Uh, in the context of this quantum optics business, to the, I mean, I'll give sort of a, 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 a silly answer. I'll give, let me give you a silly answer. Okay. <laughs> at least give some answer, right? Uh, there is no upper bound to non-classicality. So, 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 so from that point of view, uh, you would have to, uh, okay, if you put some constraint on your resources, then, then there must be, uh, but, but that's probably true for many other reasons too. I have to think about that. It, it's about, it's too bad I'm not there, right? We could really think about it. it it's, because I, I guess you're sort of when you're saying a fundamental bound, you're thinking in terms of something like lambda or something like that, right? I mean, not something that's really fundamental, not 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 not. Uh... Well, it it could be a, an engineering bound as well. So assuming that we can only do uh, quantum operations on a quantum computer in the nanosecond or picosecond range, if we have a quantum computer that's entangled with tens of thousands of qubits and this level of entanglement causes a decoherence to be in the yeah. range of femtoseconds or less, then sure we can create, theoretically we can create that kind of entanglement, but practically we can never use it and we can never do anything with it. So yeah, this is very interesting. I, I, uh, um, we have one little result, but it has, it, it, it has no immediate bearing on your question, only an indirect one. Mm -hmm. People know that if you use a beam splitter, right, and you send in, so you have a beam splitter, and here's a beam splitter, okay. Uh, uh, you have a vacuum on one side, and then you send something in the other side, and then you look if the, uh, the, the two out modes are entangled or not. And it's been known for a long time. If you send in a coherent state, or, or generally a, a a, an optically classical state, uh, then the output state is, states are not entangled. The two modes are not entangled, okay. So you have to put in something um, that is uh, non-classical. And, and we have a little bound that says how much non-classicality you have to put in, uh, a bound between the uh, and classicality you, you put in and the entanglement you get out. So that goes a bit in the direction of what you say. But now to scale that up, so to speak, <laughs> to, um, to uh, 
the, the more general question you ask, it's, uh, it's yeah, I don't know, but uh, it's in, uh, and of course I'm using another part of the work, the real last part, the part where we link it to entanglement, not the part where we uh, compute the, the rate of decay. It's not the same thing, actually. I'm using the entanglement business at the very end of the talk. Yeah. Whereas you were asking something about the, the rate of decay of the... Well, it, it's a little bit of uh, both, I guess, in, in quantum both, yes. I'm more familiar with entanglement, where we have a large entangled system, uh, how this correlates to uh, optical non-classicality. I guess they're, they're all related. If entanglement is related to optical non-classicality and then non-classicality is related to decoherence time, then their exactly, exactly. entanglement is then related to decoherence time. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I guess using this tool, it, there would be a way to get some back of the envelope calculations on how fast a large entangled system would be, or how fast it would decohere, sorry. Right. Hey, I have to think about that. I have to think about that. Okay, but yeah. It's very interesting, actually, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to give too long an answer, but no, no, no. And we I know can there discuss are, there are other questions can, already. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I think uh, Professor Mike Payne uh, wants to ask a question, and then Stafford was the second one to, wanting to ask a question. I am not host at the moment, so I can't promote. Oh, sorry, I will. Um, I don't see anybody anymore. Okay. Ah, there you are. So. David, your host now. Okay, so Professor Mike Payne will will join, uh, and, and then Stafford will ask a question after that. Okay, yeah, no, it's a lovely talk. I mean, I just really wanted to make the point with decoherence, and of course, I mean, it's partly to do with size and number of states, but also, of course, to do with mechanism. And so, because I mean, the, the example I always say is, I mean, you know, you take a superconducting magnet. I lost. Uh... The connection. I don't hear anyone. Can you hear us now, Stefan? Uh, this is a shame. I can uh, see and hear you fine, Mike. Uh, yes. Stefan, are you with us? Yes, but I didn't hear the. I only heard okay. the first three words of the question. Okay. <laughs> okay. It, it it was really just a comment because it's just that. Yeah. I mean, as you know, decoherence is is partly about size, density of states, but also about mechanism. So of course, if you, you know, I always give the example of a, you know, superconducting magnet, you know, kilometers of wire, but it's still coherent because actually there's no scattering which destroy that. So I think that the, the issue about the quantum computer is, yeah, in principle, you have this problem that essentially you've got the exponential increase in number of states in just a, you know, finite energy window. So you might expect decoherence to increase. I, mean, I think the thing there is that if you're only entangling pairwise or to four neighboring ones, it's not clear that the actual rate will scale in the same way with system size. I mean, it, it, it is a very interesting question, but you know, I think the problem is you, you need to have detailed mechanism, not just the size. If the mechanism is the same, then size, high density states, you get the standard decoherence argument. But the question is, does that really work with gates just coupled to the you know the ones around them um or not i mean it's a very open question because of course if that's true i mean even without worrying about what the ultimate size of a quantum computer is if what you're saying is true that means you have to increase the fidelity of the gates each time you add a gate to the system and that's an absolute killer so there's a really fundamental set of questions there yeah i, I again missed half of your intervention. okay sorry about that. I, I got i think uh, I'm very sorry. I, I don't know why. A good thing, but yes, of course. Um, I, I agree. What can I say? <laughs> I agree. No, and, I mean, it, it, it was only a comment. It was only a comment. No, no, no. But it's in fact uh, um, this quadrature coherence scale. Uh, of course, the first I wanted to know how it would behave under coupling to the to a bath, and so we just did the work and we we computed it. Yeah, yeah. But of course, no, no, it's it great. is. It is of course. Uh, we, we use the simplest of all models that everybody knows. I'm not saying this is a general mechanism. Well, but I mean, but the interesting thing with decoherence is that, you know, every time you do do a specific model, which is always bespoke, at least within, you know, the standard categories, you get the same result. I mean, the, the distance squared behavior that, I mean, so yeah, every single system is different, 
but I think if you have a continuum of states and any sort of form of, of you know coupling mechanism, then you get the same result. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very difficult to generalize it because there's no completely universal one. But I think given those features, you'd get that universality. So I completely agree. Yeah, okay. So actually, the, the, the claim to fame of, of this particular part of our work, in my mind, in my uh, maybe mathematician's mind, is that uh, at least within that model, the, this uh, inverse squared behavior that you mentioned, is, yeah. is, we, we prove it's general. Uh, and and yeah. No, see, no, absolutely. Yep. So, yep. so that, that's sort of nice. All the bespoke physics models give the same result, but exactly. you're more yeah. general one. So I think you're right. It's about the, the sort of the, the properties of the environment you know and and that gives you that as a general result and physicists have picked out specific ones whereas you've got that out of a much more general model than the specific bespoke examples that we deal with in physics which is why it's so good it's great yeah yeah so yeah okay thanks a lot thank you go now thank you very much for the comment not at all really good thanks a lot Yes, I think we have Professor Stafford Whittington on the call now who, who, who wants to ask a question about Hi, Stefan. Hi, yeah, so Hi. thanks for your talk. I enjoyed it a great deal. I think I, um, I followed uh, quite a bit of it, which I was pleased with. Um, so um, what isn't clear to me, it, it, I, I think if I understand you correctly, then your measure is based on the essentially the strength of the off-diagonal terms. Um, so I, I wonder what is the difference between what's contained in your measure that's not contained in the entropy? Ah, um, um, it, uh, well, if I understand your question right, it, we are not measuring the strength. We're measuring, uh, it's a combination, is the distance to the, or, to, to the diagonal. And I gave this little example. I, I don't dare to share my screen again because I'm afraid it'll go wrong. <laughs> so uh, I gave this little example where you, you computed C2 of rho, where you just compute the sum of the off-diagonal matrix elements. That's more like uh, something like the entropy. But that doesn't, you know, then you don't uh, make a distinction between an off-diagonal element that is sitting close to the diagonal or very far. The entropy type things don't measure, they're invariant under permutations, they don't measure where things sit. And, and so the, the, the quadrature coherence scale uh, weighs, it's a weighted average and it weighs uh, these different off-diagonal matrix elements with their distance from the origin. And so it's okay. a bit different. That's the difference. OK, thanks. Does it bound the very, I think in one of your papers, you discuss Rennie entropies and, and stuff like that. Ah, yes, yeah. Well, um, yeah. Um, the, the, the way I told the story today is backward. Uh, this is not the way how we invented it, actually. And, and so in the first paper, we, we came to this thing from a very different angle. We were looking at uh, the Wigner function. You know, in, in, yeah, okay, so let's do it this way. But I don't want to make it too long. Uh, okay, you, you, you take uh, this quantum optics environment, right? And people will look at the Wigner function. And uh, if the Wigner function uh, is negative in places, then you can be sure the state is uh, uh, non, uh, non-classical. But the, the, the Wigner function can be positive everywhere and the state can still be non-classical, which is one of the things people struggle with to find uh, an, an, an a measure that is if and only if. And so we were looking, and so there is another formula that I wrote on the slides, but I, I didn't comment on it. The, 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 this quadrature coherence scale is a measure of the, fluctu of, the, of the fluctuations in the Wigner function. And so you can see that as, uh, as related to some Rennie entropy, a derivative of a Rennie entropy. It's, it gets a bit, uh, but it's, it, I didn't go that way. But, but it is interesting maybe to point out that um, this um, quadrature coherence scale is also, can also be understood to be a measure of the, the rate of fluctuation of the Wigner function. And I like that idea because, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll wiggle my hands. You, you have a, fun, the Wigner function is real, right? And it, its integral is one, and one is a positive number. Now, you draw a, a, a function whose average is one, right? And, and, and it becomes negative somewhere, but then it has to compensate, right? Because its average has to be one, it has to compensate quite a bit. So it has to have a big gradient somehow. And, and this quadrature coherence scale sort of captures that. 
and and so it is linked to to a Rennie entropy, which is uh, expressed in terms of the Wigner function. But I didn't mention that today at all. Yeah, it's like super interesting stuff. I'm I'm thinking now when you're talking about like this oscillating Wigner function and like you know the more negativity you have, the more it oscillates. So there is this paper from like a year or two back by Ryuji Takagi, who's like a quantum resource person. Mm -hmm. and he said like, okay, when people talk about um, um, coherent states and stuff like this, a good mesh, like a good classicality concept is, as you said in your talk, to consider like, you know, uh, classical mixtures of coherent states as, as your like kind of, you know, canonical classical state. And then he defined, so he looks at this then from like the concept of quantum computing. So if you just have those states, you, you can't do quantum computing. And, and like, what, what does it kind of you need in order to do quantum computing with, with states? And the kind of monotone he comes up with is, so it's the logarithm of, of the integral of the absolute value of the Wigner function. So if the Wigner function is, is all positive, you know, the integral um, over it will be one and the integral over the absolute value of it will also be one. But if, if the Wigner function has negative entries, the integral over its absolute value will be greater than one. And then you take the logarithm of that. So you kind of chop off a one sure, and sure, what you're left sure. with is just, you know, some kind of measure of the negative components. And it would be super interesting to kind of see if there's some kind of map from your measure to, to his. Well, I, I think I must have seen this paper. Uh, um, let's say that, um, I mentioned it briefly. If you look at the literature, there are, you can sort of categorize the various um, uh, measures and, and monotones and, and witnesses of, of uh, non-classicality people have come up with. And one category deals with the Wigner function and sort of capturing in some way its negativity. Okay, that, that's why. And so uh, th there is at least 50 papers like that. And usually if you compare these things, they, they're all witnesses, meaning uh, that, that if something's big enough, then, then you can be sure that, that uh, the state is non-classical. And then you can start fighting about which one is, is more efficient or not. And you can usually come up with states that are detected by one witness and not by the other and the other way around. And so the integral of the absolute value, whether you take the logarithm or not, uh, it, it's a typical thing Yeah, people have looked at. Um, uh, what our claim to fame in the first paper, the one uh, in which we constructed the thing the first time, um, was that we could use it to construct an actual measure. You know, you have a witness, a witness tells you it's sort of a one-sided thing. But if you can construct a measure that says how far you are from the, 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 the set of classical states, th then th that's going to be a real measure. That, that, that's going to, if, you, if you're at distance zero, that means you're inside. And if the distance is strictly positive, you're non-classical. And so what we showed is that using our quadrature coherence scale, which had a different name in that paper, um, it, uh, you can make a measure, which is not true for all these other, uh, for some it is, but for others it's not and all that. So, so, so that was the first paper, but we came from this Wigner angle more or less. And it, it's only afterwards, I just tell the story of my life here, but <laughs> that I realized that this thing had a very simple expression in terms of the coherences. And, and, and we, had, we didn't come to it that, like that at all. Okay, um, thanks a lot, Stefan. I think uh, we're we're at twelve o'clock here. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I, I was a little long, maybe. No, no, this is perfect. We're we're right on time. But this is the the, the moment uh, where where we thank everyone who's tuned in to to listen to the talk. And for those of you who want to join Crispin and Hugo's uh, group meeting, just please stay on the call. Uh, and then for everyone else, thanks for for coming and. Uh, and we'll see you next week. Um, of course, the fun, like uh, as you said, like it would have been a completely different thing if you could actually be here. So we hope that when uh, when Corona is over, actually you will you will have the opportunity to come and visit uh, the lab and uh, uh, and Cambridge. Needless to say, I would love to, and especially. Uh... 
as you probably noticed, I mean, it's a reasonably new subject for me. I, I don't know that many people in the field, so I was very eager to come and meet some actual human beings who work on these subjects. <laughs> I really enjoyed your talk, actually. It's, it's, it's very relevant to, to what I, I've been uh, lecturing recently. So what, one of the things I, I teach is the Caldera Leggett model. Right. And um, so an, an example that we use is, is the, the, the cat state, exactly the cat state you, you showed with the codes. And I, I was wondering what your, your measure, um, you know, what, the, what the, the time dependence of your measure would be for something like a Caldera Leggett model. I mean, you know, you can, you can solve that model and see that the, the off diagonal terms decay exponentially. But I, I was wondering whether you know, with your, your measure, which, I don't know, maybe it, it captures a little bit more of the physics of it than just looking at, you know, certain off-diagonal elements. Um, let's see. There is work, you can have a look at this, maybe. Uh, yeah, so when you say caldera legate, you don't take the weak coupling limit, right? You, you actually take the actual model, is what you're saying. Yeah, oh, right. Um, the Caldera Leggett model that, that I have in my lecture course came from a paper by Zurek. So it, it has basically the Neuville von Neumann term, and then it has um, a term with some first derivatives in that uh, cause the diagonal terms to decay. And then it's got a term that has um, an x minus x prime squared. Yeah, yeah um, I know this model. I, think. I know the paper, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've read and reread that paper many times. <laughs> there is a paper by uh, Spohn, Herbert Spohn. You know Spohn? Herbert Spohn? Spohn. No, I don't know that name. I'll, I'll write, let me write it down. S-P-O-H-N -S and um, Dürr, D-U-R-R, -R, I think. I think there's two R's in it. And they did... Um, they did a model. I think it's basically what you would call a caldera legged model. And they computed it exactly somehow, but they did what you say, more or less. They, they, I can find it back. I, I think we cited probably. Yeah, well, we cited. I cited in the paper with uh, Anil. Uh, actually, tell me how, how to spell his name again. Was it S P H O N? No, no, O H N. O H N. O H N. Oh, right, that would explain why I couldn't find it. Yeah, right. And, and, and so they, I got it. I got it. Yeah. And they do the computation, but they do what you say. They compute uh, the decay of the ordinary matrix element uh, the way you say. Uh, again, what we and, and they do it in the original model without taking the what I call the weak coupling limit. You know, the, 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 when you end up with the master equation. We use the master equation, but then we we show the result for um, uh, for all states. And not just for a cat state, you see. Oh no, I'll, I'll look at this paper. Thanks very much. That's that's very interesting. So yeah, I had like many things that I kind of want to <laughs> discuss, but like maybe just on this slide where you where you mentioned like the relation to the Fisher information or the question about whether or not there is a relation to the Fisher information. I mean, there is of course like, so there, there was like the obvious, the, um, so on the slide you had something, I can't remember exactly. I it's can like try to of, put it up. Yeah, I, you can try to put it up, but like it was something like, you know, C uh, of rho is equal to two times the spectral gap of A to the power of two. Ah, that's for the pure states, yes. For pure states. And then for, for, for of course, the quantum Fisher information um, for pure states, that's upper okay. bounded. No, no, by, it's what I call well, that, it's, that, it's by a factor of two off, right? Yeah, yeah. The fact, forget the factors two, okay? No, yeah. no, mathematicians don't care about factors two, as you Okay. <laughs> uh, but so, so, I mean, there is obviously that. That. I mean, it's not upper bounded, it's equal. I mean, the delta A means really uh, the, 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 the mean square displacement. Eh? The, the, well, the um, so the quantum Fisher information is equal to that for the ideal pure state, but yes. it's, not, it's not equal to that for, for, for um, the non-ideal pure state for A. And, and that's true also for the, uh, the quadrature coherence scale. Okay, so it's just two times the variance of A. Yes. 
So let, okay. let me sum it up. Both of them, both of them agree on pure states. They're equal to the variance. Okay. Yeah. But but here here are the pure states and in the and in, in, in inside uh, there are all the mixed states and they disagree on mixed states. Right. Now, now the quantum fissure information, as you know better than me, uh, is, is, is uh, the, the, the convex roof, right? This thing that I introduced is not convex. But, but, it, uh, but in some cases, it completely agrees with the quantum fissure information. And in fact, for all, uh, for all um, Gaussian states in quantum optics, they agree. Um, for all Gaussian states in quantum, of, you mean like all classical mixtures of Gaussian states, or uh, or, or just all? Uh, uh, well, what people call Gaussian states uh, are states whose Wigner function is a Gaussian, right? Okay. So for um, all Gaussian states, they agree, but but they're different uh, in general. And and we have an example in the first paper because at the time now I know more or less what the quantum fissure information is because I've learned things. <laughs> but when we wrote the paper two years ago, I didn't know very well. But I did find some examples where the quantum fissure inf information was humongous, very large, and the quadrature coherence scale was small. And so. Um, in some sense, but you know, the quadrature coherence scale, if you remember the formula with the, the row commutator A squared, yeah. well, how do you get that? Well, it's a derivative, right? It's just a derivative of a different distance. Yeah. So it's it's not linked to the Bure distance, but to something else. And but you know, it, the Bure distance is directly connected to the Fisher information. Yes. Right? So it's it, this is linked to a different distance. And, and so okay. it measures the sensitivity of the state rho to the Heisenberg evolution with A, but in a different way than, than the, the quantum Fisher information. Yeah, so you said that your, your measure is not convex. No. But like, so, I mean, it will be convex for some states, right? Um, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean convex... pure states, for example, you know. <laughs> uh, no, but so... convex as a function of the state, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you just have one term, you know, it's going to be convex. Uh, yeah, well, yes, yeah. And, and then it's probably going to be convex for some other states, right? So you could look at how does it compare to the quantum Fisher information for, for states where it's close to the convex. I mean, because if you're uh, yeah, convex, yeah, yeah, it's going to yes, be very hard yeah. to, like, you know, map it onto, do you see what I mean? Yeah, but I've been, I, I looked at your papers, of course, right? And, and uh, I've, I, I, I can I can interpret the quadrature coherence scale as the quantum fissure information of some other state. I, I can do something, but it's a purely mathematical operation that I I'm not sure is very interesting. So uh, you can you can so you have the you have you have your like quadrature coherence thing, and then you you, you do an operation to your state, and then it's equal to the Fisher information of of this other state of the other state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this operation, as you call it, uh, generously, <laughs> is a, uh, it's a weird thing. But is it the CPTP map or no? No, it has nothing to do with it. I think no. Okay. No. So then... no, no. So it's a, a purely mathematical thing, and I, I've been struck. I struggled with that before Christmas, actually, and I have my notes, uh, and uh, and again, I would have brought those to. <laughs> To inflict them upon you because I think there is something that can be done there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's very interesting, all of it. I mean, I mean. So yeah, there is there is stuff there. That's why I put this slide up there actually because I said, well, I won't see these people, so at least I sort of. And of course, this thing that we've been working on, the Kirchhoff Dirac distribution, is kind of you know a discrete version of the Wigner function. So yes, well, the immediate, the immediate feeling is that a lot of these things you know should should translate to the Kirchhoff Dirac distribution. And yeah, I know you, you know. I mean, when I saw your paper the first time, or your talk actually, I saw there's A I B J S there, right? <laughs> you you know why I I immediately because this is exactly the way I, I think about the interference. I wrote it; it was on the slide. It's obvious. There's an obvious link, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is. Uh, I think I made some progress actually, because then I also I mentioned to you I talk I thought about um, about his business uh, this this paper you wrote uh, in, in which you have a, a sufficient condition. Yeah, I'll get there. A sufficient condition for negativity or non-classicality in the Kirkwood Dirac distribution, right? 
Yeah. And 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 I think I got some there. I got made some progress. I think on, on, on that front. Yeah. On the so you you had an idea to, to yeah yeah and this seems an to work, principle. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this seems I mean, to work, and and uh, but I mean I just have one work, one brain working slowly, and so uh, I'll send you something in the next month. I think I, I think okay. I, I I got some results there. Well, that's extremely interesting. And that would and so that would link. But then this I don't know how to do. But then then that could link again to this business where you people say that you can improve on the on the on the Kramos Rao bound, right? Yeah, by a, by a there's some stuff there yeah. that you can probably unravel. But yeah. don't, don't ask me how. I don't know. Yeah. So I think in our metrology paper, in the end of it, we kind of say, you know, like the kramer bound is, is, you know, kind of like an uncertainty principle between the variance of A and your estimator. Yeah. And then you can, you know, via post selection, you can you can make uh, your estimator more accurate. So like, you can kind of probabilistically violate this superficial. Uncertain. I didn't see that sentence. I think. Uh, I think I, I concentrated like, on the other paper. Yeah. Which is, um, you know, the one. Um, uh, well, about Kirkwood Dirac and and and. Yeah. And, and non commutativity. Uh, maybe I have a question for everyone. <laughs> if I say two observers are incompatible, what is your definition? Well, isn't it just the commutation relation? Okay, yes, I, I, I like that answer uh, because I don't agree with it. <laughs> right. Oh, well. No, no, I, I, I mean, I mean, I think that's what most people would say, right? I mean, you would say they're incompatible if they don't commute, right? Well, I, Correct. Have, I have a different kind of idea. Okay so, so, okay, so we have one. I think this is the standard thing, but go ahead, yes. So in the, in the, um, if, you're, if you're doing quantum fissure information stuff, you're doing quantum metrology. You want to measure parameters. Mm -hmm. And then in the single parameter scenario, there's like a very beautiful framework, the quantum fissure information, you calculate it and you take one over that and that gives you a bound on the variance. And there's also nice like classical proofs that show that in fact, if you use a maximum likelihood estimator, you can saturate that bound. So the quantum fissure information tells you exactly how much, um, how well you can estimate the parameter. Now, if you have a quantum state and it's gonna be encoded with two parameters. So like you're gonna hit it with e to the i theta one times a, and yeah. then you're gonna hit it with e to the i theta two times b. Then the question is, how much information can we get out of this? Mm -hmm. And the kind of naive answer would be, or the classical answer would be, you just compute a single uh, parameter Fisher information, so you calculate the variances, and then you add the variances. And that gives you a measure of, of how well you do. But in quantum mechanics, you can't do that in general, because A and B do not commute in general. So like, you know, measuring uh, an observable with A would screw up your later measurement of B and the optimal measurements of these uh, parameters will, will be different. But the case when you can get what you would classically guess that you could get out from this estimation task is when the commutator of, of A and B disappears on the Hilbert space of your state of interest rho theta oh. one, theta two. So you would take already yes. of rho theta one, theta two. And, and of course this like, you know, translates. So like if, if rho is a real matrix, A and B are real, then you will satisfy this. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this goes more in the direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so you're saying you're saying you look at the commutator of A and B, call, yeah. it, call it C, whatever, right? For commutator. Yeah. It's a self-adjoint operator, and it may have a kernel. And if you work on that kernel, whatever you do, but if you work on that kernel, then of course the, these two things will look compatible. Yeah. Okay. Right. No, that this is already, yeah, yeah. You see, my point of view is that uh, saying two 
uh, yes, two, two observables are compatible uh, if they commute. Let's say, just take that as a definition. This is a very strong condition because it's very difficult to commute. And very few, if you take two operators, they'll never commute basically. So commuting is very, very difficult. So if you then define not compatible as not commuting, then that's a very weak condition. Right, and so uh, you need, I think you need a hierarchy of uh, incompatibility conditions, which is what I did uh, in, in context, in the context of, of this, what I just said before. Uh, I, I made up some, some hierarchy of incompatibility conditions and using them, I, I can do some things with your paper there that I mentioned before. But, but so I wonder if there is literature on this. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of working a tiny bit on it. So in, in the sense of quantum fissure information, there is, and it's kind of a fascinating literature because what happens is that like, are you familiar with Berry curvature and Berry face and stuff like that? Yeah, yes, well, I, I, let, familiar is a strong word. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I know what it is, yes. So what happens is that essentially for, for things to be compatible in the parameter estimation sense is that you need the Berry curvature on the manifolds of your parameterized Hamiltonian to vanish uh, or something. be zero. To vanish, yeah, yeah. 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 So you can go around loops and come back to yeah, fall on your yeah, feet. You, you shouldn't accumulate berry face. And right. that makes sense, right? Because if you want to kind of estimate things, you don't want to accumulate something you don't know about because it will like, you know, destroy your estimation. And then Nicole and I, and I guess Hugo and Alex here as well, we've worked quite a bit on like thinking about compatibility with the Kirkwood Dirac distribution. And, you know, yeah, so in our paper, you... we've added a new example upon your recommendation to, to the paper. Um, so there, you know, you could take the definition that, you know, uh, that uh, things are compatible if the corresponding Kirkwood Dirac distribution is a probability distribution. Um, then that's a condition on, on three objects. Yeah, mm -hmm. so again, you need to think like they're compatible with respect to the state you care about. Okay, now this is exactly the way I'm going to. <laughs> Actually, I, I introduced the notion, I have to fiddle with it some more, but I, I, I decided to call it TOINC, <laughs> T-O-I-N-C, totally incompatible. <laughs> and so two bases are totally incompatible. If, 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 um, if the intersections, I, I, I know you really, you know, if you have two bases, A and B, right? You can yeah. make these projectors by making sums of the of, of the projectors on the basic vector, and you take uh, the intersections of these projectors should be uh, vanish should always vanish, except of course if these projectors get too big. So then, because in a finite dimensional space, can, can you say this again? Sorry. I'm... Well, I mean, I have some notation for this. So, okay, you have two bases, a i and b j. Yeah. Okay. And then you take a subset of with i going from one to d, mm -hmm. finite dimension. Now you take some subset uh, which I call s. Uh, you take one, seven, and nine, and then uh, for, for on the right hand side for the b's you take also some subset, two, eleven, twenty five, and thirty. And you make the corresponding projectors. Okay, and mm -hmm. now these projectors that project on subspaces a three and a four dimensional subspace. The intersection of the subspace should always vanish. This is your that's, definition. That's the definition. And, and that's I mean, this is very similar to what we're playing around with in our paper, right? Because we have these vectors and we say, if so many of them are like, you know. But if you use that notion, then you can, you, I mean, then there is two, well, of course, they cannot always vanish, right? Because if I take D minus one here and D minus one there, the intersection, there's not enough room, right? Yeah. So you, you cannot take too many, of course, but you take, you know. and so- um, Isn't this what our theorem shows, like how many you can take? No, because the theorem, oh, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> the theorem tries to figure out how many you can take uh, and, and be, uh, be non-classical. In the sense of the Kirkwood Dirac business there, but yeah. I'm, before doing that, you have to wonder in this Hilbert space, how many can you take? Before talking about non-classicality, and that okay. depends on i and b. That doesn't depend yeah. on 
Yeah. So you settle that question first. And this is now a property. Toinkness <laughs> is a property <laughs> of, of, the, of the basis. And then you say, hmm, now are there states here uh, that, uh, that are non-classical? Once I have a two toink bases, right? Now let me look around. Which states are have a Kirkwood Dirac negativity or, or well, negative complex complexness? Actually, I didn't really look into negativity. I just looked at complex. And then you can fiddle with the proofs that you wrote, and you 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 can get sharper results. And so so very interesting. And you can make this this toink thing is the top of the uh, but, but you can make a hierarchy. I understand, yeah. And so this is this is of course the other thing I wanted to do on on the board with you. We should talk again, I guess. Yeah. So I've been yeah I've been playing around, but again it's from like a parameter estimation scenario. So if we had this like you know incompatibility requirement that like the trace of row commutator a comma b should disappear. So if this right. is you know what we say, then there are like funny examples. Where where like things seem very non-classical, but 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 still you know this thing disappears. So, in in dimension two, so for qubits you have x, y, and z as operators yes. that have mutually unbiased bases. But yeah. in, in dimension four you have a triplet, call them a, b, and c, that have mutually unbiased bases, but all of these bases can be expressed as real vectors. So then if you choose you know row from or row from C and then A and B are your matrices, then this you know trace row commutator A comma C will disappear despite the fact that these these things are made from mutually unbiased like naively maximally incompatible. No, no, no. I mean uh, this is another thing. Mutually unbiased is a very weak thing. <laughs> It's I mean, it depends. And, 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 you know, if you're, if you're doing tomography, it's the best thing you can have. No, there is, you can, within, within mutually unbiased, you can be better. Some, some guys are better than others. If you, you can be mutually unbiased, unbiased and not toink at all. So, so there is. Yeah, a, I mean, this, what I said is an example of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and this, I, I, this is what I mentioned to you, I guess. I, there is a, a paper by Tao, you know, the mathematician, uh, who, who proves things about the discrete uh, Fourier transform. And, 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 and I sort of got, I mean, I started from there. Okay. So the discrete Fourier transform is always uh, an MUB, right? Yeah. But it's, uh, it's toink only when the, when the dimension is uh, a prime number. Uh, and so you, I mean, you can do funny things. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, this took me three months to figure out. Yeah. As I said, like, this is why the number of mutually unbiased bases is known in prime for prime. For prime. I bet it's. I bet it's linked to that. Yeah. Yeah. Although I haven't explored that very much, but yes, it must be linked. Yeah. Hmm. Well, yeah, this has been super interesting. I think Hugo now has some students who's going to tell us about 